as someone said to me a little earlier today, I'm going to rattle a cage a bit. Uh, so I guess that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk to you about the use and abuse of culture. Um, and um, I'm going to be fairly critical of the way these terms, terms are used. The terms culture and, and particularly safety culture are very widely used by safety professionals and uh, in, in business circles. Um, and I'm very familiar with that term being a sociologist because culture is, is our bread and butter in sociology and in anthropology. It's been uh, sort of the core concept in those disciplines for 100 years or more. But uh, safety culture is very much a Johnny come lately. It's a, it's a new concept, really uh, start, appeared on the, on, the, on the scene late last century. Um, it is very much a Johnny come lately. And it's one of the most um, misused and abused of all these, these terms. Now, I'm not the first to make that point. Uh, I think in the year 2000, there was a, uh, a safety journal editorial that made the point that it was called um, uh, safety, uh, Culture's Confusions, and the author uh, made the point that there is no agreement, confusion reigns about the meaning of these terms in safety and business circles, and nothing has changed. There, there, is con there continues to be, nearly 20 years later, um, uh, the terms, I like to use the term fog, I think that safety culture is a bit like a fog that comes down and, uh, and, and um, eyes glaze over and meaning disappears from the conversation uh, when we start to use these terms. Okay, so um, the first, I'm going to advance five propositions. The first one will, first five will be about, sorry, six propositions. The first five will be about culture. Only the last will be about safety culture because most of the focus is, is, needs to be on the concept of culture itself. So the first question I want to raise is this. Um, is culture a characteristic of individuals or of a culture, uh, characteristic of groups? Um, when management seeks to change culture, what are they trying to do? They're actually trying to change, the, the terms you hear are things like mindset. They're trying to change the mindsets of individuals. They're trying to change core personal values. This is the language um, that we hear. Um, so core personal values, mindset, it's clearly in the minds of, of these managers who are advocating uh, cultural change, they see culture as a matter of individual um, values, individual um, characteristics. So here's the safety manager of uh, one large company. He says, safety performance has been achieved through our unwavering commitment and dedication from all levels in the organisation to create a safety culture which is genuinely accepted by employees and contractors as one of their primary core personal values. Okay, and he went on, the aim is to create a mindset that no level of injury is acceptable. And if that is the, uh, the approach you have to culture, how do you achieve it? Via education. Clearly, if you're trying to change people's values and attitudes, some kind of educational um, process is what is required. And the implicit, implicit assumption here is that culture is the characteristic of individuals. Now, that stands in, in stark contrast um, with the views of uh, social scientists for whom culture is a characteristic of a group. And if it's a characteristic of a group, we must always specify which group we are talking about. Um, when people talk about culture, you must ask, well, what the culture of whom? Culture of what group are you talking about here? Is it the work group? Is it the organisation? Is it the corporation? Um, the point is that each of these has its own culture. They may, be, they may overlap, but they're not necessarily the same. And we need to understand that fact because that helps us to understand a lot of the complexity we see in subcultures within organisations. So let me draw out the, um, the implication of this notion uh, or the implication of this distinction I'm making because there are some significant implications of the distinction. If culture is a characteristic of individuals, it means that individuals can take it from one group to another. If it's a characteristic a bit like personality, a relatively invariant uh, characteristic of an individual, then we can take it from one um, group to another. So here is another company uh, spokesman saying, saying this. Um, real commitment, he's trying to inculcate a safety culture in his people. Real commitment to safety can't be turned on at the entrance gate uh, at the start of the day and left behind at the gate on the way home. Safety and well-being of fellow employees is extended beyond the workplace in this company 
A true commitment to safe behaviour is developed by promoting safety as a full-time, 24-hour uh, uh, attitude, um, both on and off the job. And that, I, that whole focus depends upon the assumption that um, culture and safety culture is the characteristic of individuals. But if culture is a characteristic of, um, of, a, of a group, it's a group property, then the attitudes to safety may indeed change when we pass through the factory gate. One thing on one side of the gate, because we're in one group on one side of the gate, we may be in a quite a different group on the other side of the gate. When we pass through the gate, the next thing we may do is go and uh, join our friends in the motorcycle club or the hang gliding club, in which the attitudes to risk will be totally different from the attitudes to risk which are encouraged within the, within the workplace. And in that external peer group, um, the culture there is quite different from the culture uh, in the workplace. And the individual can move perfectly happy without even realising what they're doing from one set of attitudes towards safety which are, which are appropriate in the workplace to another set of attitudes which are appropriate in the hang gliding club or the motorcycle club where the aim of many people is to go as close to the edge as you can because that way you are demonstrating your skill. And the people who fall over the edge, the usual view is they were careless or they were silly, but it won't happen to me because I go as close to the edge as I can and I'm skillful so I stay on the right side of that edge. So the attitude to risk in that kind of context may well be absolutely different from the attitude uh, in the workplace. So um, that's the, prop that's the uh, proposition, the first proposition I want to uh, recommend to you, that culture is the characteristic of a group, not an individual, and talk of culture must always specify the relevant group. If it doesn't, it's incomplete. You really haven't said very much until you specify which group it is you're talking about. Second proposition um, concerns um, the influence of national cultures. A nation is the group here, the relevant group is the nation, so we can talk about a national culture. There will be certain attitudes and values and behaviours which are characteristics of, of nations. Companies often complain, I hear them complaining quite bitterly, that they're, they're, they're fighting with a national culture which is overriding their own attempt to create a, a culture of safety within their organisation. That the national culture is more powerful than the organisational culture that they are trying to promote. So I hear, for example, big companies working in both Australia and PNG talking about um, Australian workers have a certain attitude to culture, to rules and procedures, which is one of resistance, and uh, um, they're not willing to comply with things unless they see the point. Whereas the workers in PNG will do whatever they are told, and this they see as a demonstration of difference in national culture. Now, I'm a bit sceptical of that analysis because I suspect there's another issue here, and that is the extent to which those workers are vulnerable in their jobs, and I think that a worker in PNG working for a big company is probably a lot more vulnerable than a worker in Australia is, and so that may well account for those differences. But nevertheless, let's assume there are um, these, these national differences. Now, what I want to say to you is that there are some careful studies, good studies done by psych uh, psychologists, which demonstrate that um, organisational cultures can override national cultures if the organisation so wishes, if they put the energy into it. Uh, the conclusion of one of these studies was that perceived management commitment to safety exerts more of an impact on workforce behaviour and subsequent accident rates than do fundamental national values. So that, I, that I, I reiterate that was a careful study which over a lot of people looking at variations between national cultures and also variations between organisational cultures, and it came to that conclusion that the organisational culture perceived commitment to safety is, the most, is more important than national culture in determining the, the behaviours of individuals. And when you think about it, it's, it's not... There are some examples which demonstrate the point fairly convincingly. I was talking to a big multinational oil company some years ago, they were about to build a very large vessel in a Korean shipyard and they were concerned that uh, the fatality rate in Korean shipyards was very high and from their point of view quite unacceptably high and they tended to see this as a feature of uh, Korean culture, national culture, as opposed to uh, the European, this was Shell actually, Shell's culture and the, and the national context in which other European contexts in which 
Shell operates would not have accepted that high rates, high fatality rates, which were apparently accepted in the Korean shipyards. And the question was, how are we going to deal with this, 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 uh, national, this presumed national culture in Korea? Well, to their credit, they didn't accept that this was somehow or other something that was, say, was inevitable, inevitable. They said, we are not going to accept that. We are going to demand that, uh, and this was part of the contract, that if anybody is killed in the shipyard, that the, the senior manager in that area will be sacked immediately. And the first time this happened, that person, the manager was sacked immediately and the safety behaviour in that shipyard just changed like that, just like that. Uh, because Shell had put in place a really powerful mechanism to ensure um, that it got the safe behaviour that it wanted. It was not intimidated by the notion of national culture. Um, I don't believe in national... I mean, I don't think, in fact, this is an aspect of national culture. It's more an aspect of the level of economic development of countries because that same behaviour was very prevalent in the UK in the 19th century. Um, so it's, it's about where you are in terms of your economic um, development. But uh, organisations, corporations can, if they wish, and if they put the energy into it and make the commitment, they can create uh, the cultures they want. So this is the, the next proposition then, that um, uh, organisations have it within their power to ensure that organisational cultures override national cultures. There's an interesting corollary here that I sometimes get asked, uh, or often the question is asked, how long does it take to change a culture, and I was at a conference a little while ago where a very eminent speaker said, oh, it's hard to change the culture of a big organisation. takes five to seven years. And I thought, that's just nonsense. The fact of the matter is, as soon as the behaviour of the top managers changes and there are consequences, the culture begins to change. It's very quick. It's actually very quick if the people at the top mean it. They have to mean it. Um, so, I mean, you don't get, you don't change the whole culture of the organisation overnight, but there's a process that starts, which is a rapid process, takes place quickly. Okay, now the next one I want to talk about is the, the definition of culture. And, uh, of course, there are numerous meanings of culture. In anthropology, in anthropology the, the term refers to the meanings which people attach to artefacts. That's a standard kind of definition in anthropology also, and, and often in sociology. Now, within organisational context, that's not as relevant. There are other kinds of, uh, of meanings which uh, we use, and they divide roughly into two main approaches, those which emphasise uh, values and norms of groups. So we're always talking about groups. The ideational elements, if you like, and on the other hand, the practices, the, the, the things that people do. Uh, the organisational practices. Um, and most definitions will emphasise one or the other. Uh, these are not contradictory definitions, but there is a question about which of these definitions is useful to emphasise. And my view is that the most useful to emphasise is it's the way we do things around here. Now, I realise that's a, um, a simplistic... Well, some might think it's a simplistic definition, but I actually think it's a very sophisticated definition which does incorporate most of what we need to um, um, think about when we're talking about cultures. So it's the practices. Now, why do I say it's sophisticated? Well, first of all, around here, that's a reference to a group. Around here means it's vague, but it, it's, it's saying we need to think about, well, what does around here mean? Is it the work group, the peer group? Is it the organisation? What is it? It could even be the nation. Um, so there is a reference to the group. Um, involved or implied in that definition. That's the first point of sophistication about that, about that definition. Um, the second thing is it's collective. It's what we do. This is not about individual practices. It's the, it's the practices of the group. So there's a, a collectivity involved here. Uh, and the third interesting thing is that there is a value element to that expression. Now, I don't know what you think about this, but when someone says, this is the way we do things around here, can you hear a kind of normative statement, this is the way we ought to do things? That's implied in that, isn't it? If anyone says, this is the way we do things, what you're hearing is not only do we do it this way, but we ought to do it. So that's the, norm <coughs> the normative element coming in there, the value element, the, um, the psychological element, if you like. Um, 
So that definition incorporates all that's important, in my view, in, in culture, and it's a very helpful definition to, to, to um, think about, because um, partly because it helps us get away from the waffle, it helps us say, all right, well, what is culture? It's what we're doing around here. It's the practices, the collective practices. I've seen people say, put up models and fancy models saying, here is uh, organisational practices here, and that leads to a culture. And I say, no, 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 it's the organisational practices are the culture. If you, at the moment you say they lead to a culture, you're asking, well, what is this culture? What is this thing? It's, it's, it becomes very nebulous. No, the culture is the organisational practices, what we collectively do around here. Um, <coughs> so the, the normative element, this is the right, or this is the right way, this is the accepted way that we do things around here. How do we know it's the, the, uh, that there is that normative component? By the reaction. If there is, because it's the reaction which it demonstrates that this is required behaviour. Um, I remember going down, walk in, being in a large headquarters of a large organisation a few years ago, and I was walking down a staircase and I had a bag in each hand, and I certainly therefore wasn't um, holding the handrail. And one of the managers who I was with said, oh, look, would you like me to hold one of your bags as we go down here so you can hold the handrail? So I said, thanks. So um, that was a, uh, a reaction to my non-compliance with that company rule. As, as you know, most big companies stick rigidly to that rule and other similar, sometimes trivial rules when they should be focused on more serious things. But... Um, uh, it was rigidly adhering to that rule. I knew this was a rule because there had been a reaction to my non-compliance. It wasn't a punitive reaction, but it was a reaction that made me realise um, that I better do the right thing around here. This is the way. This is the way they do things around here. On the other hand, on my campus, the ANU, there is a, there are signs saying uh, uh, in the pedestrianised areas, "Cyclists must dismount." Well, cyclists never dismount, um, and there are never any consequences. So what we say then is despite the university rules and the university's belief about what ought to be the case, that is not part of the culture because it's not part of the way, th way things are done around, around my campus. Okay, so um, I think uh, there's another reason for preferring a, a definition which focuses on practices rather than trying to talk about mindset or values or those ideational components. Um, and that is this, that if, you've, if you're really going to focus on practices, they can be seen, observed and changed, therefore. Management can seek to change those practices. Um, whereas values are much harder to change, uh, harder to see, identify, harder to change. Let me read to you the words of an organisational anthropologist who says this. Changing collective values of adult people in an intended direction is extremely difficult, if not impossible. Values do, do change, but not according to someone's master plan. Collective practices, however, depend on organisational characteristics like structures and systems and can be influenced in more or less predictable ways by changing those structures and systems. So this is a reason, a practical reason for focusing on practices rather than values. And I need to make the point that these two things are complementary, that it's not about um, focusing on practices and ignoring values. They go inextricably hand in hand. And let me tell you why. It's because there's a fundamental human characteristic that we don't like our behaviour to be out of alignment with our values. Um, we'll tolerate it to, to varying degrees, but on the whole, we like our behaviour to be in alignment with our beliefs and our values. Psychologists call that cognitive dissonance. We don't like things to be inconsistent, our values to be inconsistent with our behaviour. So um, the uh, interesting thing then is that if you, if you um, change the behaviour and it's, no longer, it's not, no longer consistent with the previous values of that person, those values will shift and over time and come into alignment with with the, the new behaviour. So I'll give you a specific example that always strikes me as a powerful one. Many years ago now, when seat belts were introduced, um, um, people simply didn't, didn't wear them. And so they, it was not necessary. It didn't, safety, from their point of view, safety didn't really require the wearing of a seat belt. That was their mindset, their attitudes, their values. However, then the seat belts were made compulsory and 
people, you started to get uh, fined for not wearing your seatbelt, so of course you buckle up. And then after a while, that becomes the habit and uh, becomes the way we do things around here is we buckle up. The, uh, the ultimate reason we do this is because if we, if we don't, we might get fined. But now, we've, we're, we're now faced with a situation where we're routinely buckling up, but we previously thought this was not necessary. So now our values start to change, our beliefs start to change. We say, oh, this is probably a good idea, that really it's, um, it's going to save lives if we, if we buckle up in this way. So that's an example of the way you change the behaviour and then the, the values change, the thought processes will change. And it's interesting, it becomes such routine behaviour, so accepted, that if you take off um, without your seatbelt buckled up, not only will your car beep at you, but if you get over that fact, you're, you're likely to feel a little unsafe. There's a, a strange feeling, oh, there's something not quite right here. Um, and you're likely, if some psychologists have done some interesting work on that, for a short period you're going to drive more safely and more carefully because you know you're not buckled up and therefore you're at greater risk. That, that doesn't last for very long. Uh, but it's a demonstration of how this attitude now that wearing the seatbelt um, is, 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 is appropriate, safe behaviour, that idea is now ingrained in our, in our thinking. Okay, so let's move on to the next proposition. Uh, um, I want to talk about description versus explanation. Um, culture as description versus culture as explanation. I think, I think it's really important to think a bit conceptually about, about, about culture. If we consider an idea that, um, uh, the idea of a culture of casual compliance, I've often um, come across this, this phrase or something like it when people are explaining an accident, they say, oh, this organisation had a, a culture of uh, casual compliance. Um, now, that's the best way to think of that is as a descriptive statement, not an explanatory statement. It's a descriptive statement. And it's a statement that people feel no particular need to comply around here. They comply with rules when they find it convenient to do so um, and not, not otherwise. So that's, I think, a useful way in which we can, we can talk about culture, think of culture as a description. Now, we can also treat it as an explanation. Explanation for what? an explanation for individual level behaviour. If, um, uh, if, if the culture around here is that when we do work at heights, we don't actually wear the appropriate safety harness, then if I, as a new worker, say, oh, shouldn't we be wearing a harness when I go up there and I get poo-pooed by my fellows, then I will feel constrained not to wear that safety harness in the, in the appropriate way and I'm likely not to do so. So in that case, the, uh, the culture of, the, of, of that workplace does become an explanation for why I, as a new worker, adopt that behaviour because it's, uh, cultures have this coercive, this normative effect on individuals. It becomes an explanation then for my behaviour. Okay, um, so I actually... And so it's useful if you're trying to explain the behaviour of an individual, but if we want to go back a step and think about... Think about uh, culture as a description of the collective behaviour of the group. It is a useful, um, a useful description uh, because it collects together an, into one category a set of behaviours um, which then you can start to say, well, why is it that people are not complying in this, that and the other, in the other circumstance? And so that in itself invites a higher level of understanding. It invites um, a quest to explain why it is that we have this culture of casual compliance. And as soon as you ask that, that why question, you get into very useful kinds of explanatory factors like lack of supervision or incentive systems that are encouraging uh, people to take shortcuts or the fact that the procedures themselves are very difficult to comp comply with, they're poor procedures. And these are really useful explanations because you can do something about it. We can really do something about that. Um, <clears throat> Okay, um, on the other hand, if we treat it as an explanation of individual behaviour and say this person didn't wear their seatbelt because there's a, there's a uh, culture in this group of not wearing their seatbelt, that then in, um, works against explanation. Like this becomes a, a strategy for blaming all the people involved and as soon as you start to blame people, 
interestingly, the quest to understand and explain goes out the window. I'm not sure why that is. It seems to be a fundamental psychological fact that if we can pin blame on somebody, our quest to understand disappears. So it's not very useful. It's not a very useful um, strategy to say, okay, we're going to use culture as an explanation for this individual behaviour because we identify um, a failure of the culture level at the level of culture, end of story. It must not be the end of the story. That's the point where we begin, where we begin our explanation. Okay, so um, I think the proposition I want to leave you with in this point, at this point is this one, sorry, that in the organisational context, it's usually better to treat culture as a description of group behaviour because that invites the why question, why are they behaving in this way, rather than as an explanation for individual behaviour because that stifles the why question. It, it terminates the the five why process which we should we should be uh, should be adopting okay now the next thing i want to talk about is the sources of uh, uh, organizational culture then if we we accept that we want to understand why this culture exists as it does what are some of the sources what are the, some of the um, factors that give rise to cult the culture that we observe and the first one is is um, structure the structure of the organization now i'm going to give you um an example of how organisational structure creates culture in a different context, not safety, not immediately about safety anyway. And it's the culture of railways. The, one of the very powerful elements of the culture of railways is a powerful commitment to on-time running or punctuality. Um, trains are supposed to hit their targets within, within three minutes. So this is a very powerful culture that operates in most railway environments. Uh, and what that often means is that trains are travelling faster than they should be, they're travelling un un dangerously fast, and uh, in order to comply with that culture of on-time running. And the reason I'm interested in this is because the Glenbrook train crash accident investigation some years ago in New South Wales identified this culture of punctuality, of on-time running, as one of the causal factors leading to that accident because the driver was speeding in order to catch up time. So the question is, how is that culture of on-time running um, created? It's a, and now, it's not just a mindset. I've made this point, so it's a set of practices. It's a detailed monitoring of the driver's performance. Uh, there are sanctions against drivers who fail to meet schedules. Um, one driver at the, at the inquiry um, described how when he, if he arrived late, he was subject to quite intimidating questioning questions he would get from his supervisor were something like this. You lost time, son. Where? Speak up. Speak clearly. In other words, he'd done the wrong thing and he was being, being criticised for this and possibly punished for it. And if his reason was not satisfactory, a more senior management manager spoke to the driver. In extreme cases, there would be a fine or suspension for the day. All of that involves a massive organisational um, apparatus large numbers of people whose job it is to ensure that the, ta the trains run on time. The figures are assembled twice a day and presented to the top management of the train company twice a day in relation to the morning peak hour and the afternoon peak hour. It gives you a sense of how closely they are scrutinising these the, the data, the systems that they have to ensure that their, um, their trains run on time. A massive organisational Apparatus. So that's a, a very clear example in the way a structure, an organisational structure, will create a culture, the culture of on-time running. Okay, so that's the first point, that stru the structure of an organisation will create the, um, um, the culture within that organisation. Culture and structure are somehow independent factors uh, that have to be dealt with, um, have to be balanced in some way. Um, what I'm putting to you is a rather different proposition that the culture is actually created by the structure. You get the structure right, you resource it right, and you'll get the culture you want. Um, so um, how you resolve that dif divergence of opinion maybe is up to you, but the, there are different perspectives on, on these things. Okay. Um, so this, but now the second interesting um, approach um, to how you create the culture is leadership. Leadership is often suggested as the way we uh, 
approach, uh, uh, create the culture we want. And um, Ed, Ed, Edgar Schein, I think an organisational psychologist, makes this point. Leaders create cultures um, while managers and administrators live within. This particular quote is a provocative, sarcastic quote. If you're happy to be a manager, fine, you live within the culture. But if you're a leader, um, you recognise you have the capacity to change it. Now, how do leaders change cultures? Um, they create and change cultures by what they systematically pay attention to. This means anything from what they notice and comment on to what they measure, control, reward, and in other ways systematically deal with. Think about on-time running. How did those managers create that structure, that cu culture of on-time running? By measuring, controlling, and rewarding the behaviour they wanted. So, um, so in other words, these two um, uh, approaches I'm talking about, structure and leadership, are actually consistent with each other. What we have is the, the leaders, if they want to create a certain culture, have to create a culture, uh, a structure of um, rewards and, and um, um, measurement and control and so on, which will generate the, the culture that they want. And once we understand, if we see that as a causal, <coughs> excuse me, a causal connection and it's a structure that creates the organisational culture, we can then go a step further and ask, well, where does that organisational structure come from? Why are the leaders setting up um, that kind of structure? And we'll often find that we need to go outside the organisation to understand why it has the structure um, that it has. In the case of railways, why are they so concerned about punctuality? It's, there are there's enormous pressure exerted on them from outside the organisation by various political and public channels to run on time, and indeed there are regulators who may even penalise them for failure to run on time. So. Um, the proposition I'm, I want to suggest to you, and I'm going to um, um, read it slowly so that we can really think about it. Organisational cultures uh, depend on the structures that organisations put in place to achieve important outcomes. These structures reflect the priorities of top leaders. The priorities of leaders in turn may depend on factors outside the organisation, such as regulatory pressure and public opinion, or shareholder pressure, market pressure, these are the best known examples of external pressure which will dictate the kind of structures that many organisations put in place. Now finally, uh, a few words about safety culture. Um, let me start with uh, the definition which is widely quoted when, you start, when, when, when anyone starts to think about safety culture. This is probably the most widely quoted definition and which then is immediately ignored. And let me ex explain what I mean. Um, here is a definition from the, um, I think I have it here, yeah, the International Ag uh, Atomic Energy, Energy Agency. Safety culture, this was I think created after the Chernobyl uh, nuclear accident which where safety culture became quite a significant concept and idea. And the uh, agency produce this definition. Safety culture is that assembly of characteristics and attitudes which establishes that as an overriding priority, nuclear plant safety issues receive the attention warranted by their significance. Now, obviously, it's in the context of a nucle the nuclear uh, um, accident. But uh, it's where safety is an, as an overriding priority is, um, is given an overriding priority. Then we can speak of a safety culture it's only when it is the organisation gives that as an overriding priority that we can speak of a safety culture. Now, for most organisations, safety is not an overriding priority. And many people will make the point that it cannot be, otherwise the organisation would be out of business. It's possibly only the organisations which are not strictly in business, like um, aspects of the military and some other um, activities, they're not where their primary goal is not business, that they can make a commitment to safety as an overriding priority, at least in, uh, in peacetime. Um, so for most organisations, safety is not an overriding priority. It follows that most organisations do not have a safety culture. That follows as a matter of logic. I hope you understand that. As a matter of logic, most organisations do not have a, um, 
a safety culture. I remember hearing Judith Hackett making this very point uh, at a previous conference that I went to, that very few organisations can really claim that they have a safety culture in the sense that it's a culture where safety is the overriding priority. <coughs> Yet, people will give you that definition and immediately ignore it because they will immediately start talking about all organisations having a safety culture. It may be a good safety culture or a bad safety culture or a indeterminate safety culture, but when you listen to people talking, they are assuming that all organisations have a safety culture. Now, I don't know, uh, as an academic, I just can't stand that kind of inconsistency. It just blows me away. I just get really irritated by it. But that's my particular um, uh, cross to bear, I guess. But anyway, that's just one of many problems um, associated with the, co the concept of safety, safety culture. Here's how one review of the concept describe the situation. There is no agreed definition on the term safety culture and no definitive model of safety culture. The literature is large, diverse, fragmented, confusing and ambiguous. There is little evidence supporting or this is little evidence supporting a relationship between safety culture and safety performance. In a practical sense it is fruitless to continue to attempt to define safety culture rather than trying to change something as nebulous as safety culture the focus should shift to changing the organisational and management practices that have an immediate and direct impact on workplace safety. Now, I, to which I say, wow, if I were a safety practitioner, I would breathe a sigh of relief. I can ditch this concept of safety culture and get on with what's important. It's the practices in this organisation. I don't need to worry about whether I call this culture or safety culture or I don't need any other language to deal with this. I can get straight onto the is issue of getting, focusing on the organisational practices and, and getting, them, getting them right. Um, let me give you a practical example of what all this means. Um, I was studying BP Texas City, a big accident that BP had in Texas well, more than 10 years ago. I discovered that they, that BP had had a culture change program um, just a few months before the accident. They were trying to change their safety culture in a particular way. For those of you who know, know this language, they were trying to encourage BP to be a high reliability organisation. Don't worry about that if you don't know what, that, what that's referenced to. But what they were trying to do is to get people to be sensitive to warning signs and weak signals of, of danger, that danger might lie ahead. Those words are in, in quotation marks because this is what they were actually trying, the language they were using. And um, people, that they went through workshops and people got pretty good at um, identifying warning signs and weak signals of danger lying ahead and were started to report these things as they were supposed to. Uh, but the problem was the organisation did nothing with the reports because it had not uh, allocated any additional resources to respond to those reports. Um, and so people became, became rapidly very disillusioned with that, with that, whole, uh, that whole approach. The problem was there were no practices to match what they were trying to uh, teach their workforce. So that's what we need to, need to get right. We need to focus on those practices of, in this case, what do we do? How do we respond to reports which our workforce provides to us? Think about these terms, safety culture, organisational culture, workplace culture, peer group culture, aviation culture. Um, which is the odd one out? I'm going to suggest to you, well, any, any suggestions as to which is the odd one out? Aviation, aviation any, any other suggestion? Well, for me, the, the uh, I mean, I can see why you say aviation, but for me, the one that's the odd one out is safety culture. Why? Because all the others are a reference to the group. Aviation is a reference to the, uh, the aviation industries. In that sense, it's a group. But safety culture is the only one that doesn't give a reference to a group. Safety is an adjective. And so immediately begin to see there's something funny about this concept. Um, but I've got to the point where I, um, I, um, I'm, I've really abandoned the term altogether. When I wrote a book some years ago called Safety, Culture and Risk, it was with a comma after safety, as you can see on the screen. Even then, that was uh, more than 10 years ago, I was um, disturbed about the concept. But now I think if I had my way, I would ban it from the English language. So. <laughs>
Uh, I'll just say, that doesn't mean to say we need to. I mean, you can replace it. Very often, you can just replace it with safety. Why don't we just say safety? Or um, the concept I like is operational excellence. We can advocate a culture of operational excellence. That's a much more powerful concept for me than a culture of safety. So I'm not abandoning. I think it's good to have language that we can use. We need to get the right language. So thank you very much. Thank you.